Financing a multifamily building can feel very daunting if it's your first time doing it. There are also many more elements in play when it comes to multifamily financing. So if you're not exactly sure what to expect, this could easily kill a deal and it can also leave you exposed to potential risks. In this video, I'll break down four ways to finance a multifamily building in Canada. Stick around until the end of the video where I'll share some hidden costs that apply to multifamily buildings that do not apply to standard residential financing that you may not be aware of. Hey, what's up? Darren Boros here. My mission is to help you reduce your real estate investing education time from months to minutes. Subscribe not to miss what's coming. For context, a multifamily building is often referred to as a commercial loan. Not because you're investing in commercial real estate like a strip mall or retail. Rather, when we refer to commercial lending, we're referring to how the bank evaluates the asset. With a single family dwelling or anything up to five units, the bank will look at a combination of what the property brings in in revenue and also your personal ability to back the loan. When it comes to commercial financing, the threshold is usually six units or more and in this case, the bank is evaluating the asset like a business. If the business makes money, they will finance it. If the business does not make money, they will not be interested. So with that in mind, let's look at the four ways to finance a multifamily building with a commercial loan. Number four, and by far the most popular, is conventional financing. What I mean by conventional is that a commercial lender will qualify the property without the assistance of an insurer. We'll get to the insurance backed products later on. With a conventional loan at a major bank, the lender will generally finance 75% of the property's value. The remaining 25% would be taken care of by the borrower. Now remember, with commercial lending, the bank does not generally use the comparable value approach, which means they don't look at neighboring properties in the area because they're not relevant. Go back to thinking about this as a business. If I had two businesses side by side and one sold luxury furniture and the other one was Ikea, even though they're in the furniture business, the value of those businesses would be very different based on how much revenue those companies bring in. Commercial real estate is no different. So a conventional lender will take the net operating income and use a cap rate to figure out the value of the building. And from there, they will lend based on their lending criteria. Number three is a private loan. Private loans are not just for flips and smaller projects. You can also get a private loan for a multifamily building. While these are less common, they are necessary in some cases, such as when a building is not generating income or if there is significant repairs that need to take place on the property. These properties are referred to as distressed assets and a conventional lender will not finance them because they don't generate enough income, if any income at all. There are many different kinds of private loans. This could be an individual lending out money, a syndication, which is a group of investors lending out money, or a MIC which stands for a mortgage investment corporation. This is a larger group of investors that pool their money together to lend out. Either way you go when it comes to private money, it's all very similar. You should expect higher interest rates and more legal fees. Number two, the vendor take back or seller financing. There's nothing saying that you have to go to a bank to finance a property. In the multifamily investing space, many sellers are used to holding a mortgage on their properties. This is commonly known as a vendor take back or seller financing. In this scenario, a seller of a property would offer a potential buyer the opportunity to purchase the property from them, but still hold a mortgage on the property as a way to continue to make money without owning or managing it. These are generally short-term situations, and by short-term in the commercial world, I mean one to five years, but they are much more common with multifamily buildings than they are with smaller residential properties. If you wanna learn more about vendor takebacks or seller financing, it's something that I teach in my masterclass. To find out more, click on the link in the description below or check out my website at darrenvoros.com. And the number one way to finance a multifamily building in Canada is with a CMHC insured loan. Now, I don't want to confuse you because this confused me when I first heard about it. So let me be clear. CMHC is not a lender. They are an insurer. So you go and get a conventional loan from a bank and because CMHC is offering the bank insurance on that loan, you can get better terms from that lender. Now, there are fees involved here and the criteria for getting one of these approvals is much more detailed, but if you can qualify, the terms are significantly better. For those of you not familiar with the new MLI Select program through CMHC, this program was designed specifically to try to increase the amount of rental units coming on the market as we have a housing shortage. The MLI Select program uses three criteria to qualify properties and is based on a points system. Each one of the categories has various points that you can receive and the more points you have, the better loan terms you get. 
The three criteria are affordability, energy efficiency, and accessibility. While you can achieve the maximum points on an existing building, it's much easier to hit the criteria on a new build, and this is why I'm so bullish on building new. For example, if you're building new, 25% of your units need to be deemed as affordable. If your building is already operating as a multifamily building, 80% of the units need to be deemed affordable. If you're trying to hit your energy efficiency criteria, you need to be 40% above the minimum building code to achieve maximum points. This is the same for both existing assets and new builds. While it can be incredibly difficult to take an existing building and get it to 40% above the minimum building code for efficiency, on a new build, this is not that high of a bar. And the last criteria is accessibility. Building units that are accessible and barrier free is another way to achieve better loan terms. Now, you might be wondering if all of this extra energy and effort is worth it, but I can assure you that it is. Under the new MLI Select program, if you can achieve 100 points, you can borrow up to 95% of the value of the property. You can amortize that loan over 50 years, and in most cases, these are non-recourse loans, meaning that if you default on your payment to the lender, they can only go after the property, but they cannot go after your personal assets. If you want to find out more about CMHC's MLI Select program, I'll leave the link for it in the description below. As promised, I wanted to share some of the hidden costs of financing a multifamily building in Canada that do not exist on a smaller residential project. One thing you'll most likely need on a commercial loan is an environmental inspection. These can cost about $3,000 for a phase one environmental, and they can take up to three weeks to produce the report. The second thing you should be aware of is that even if you're working with one of the big six banks in Canada, with a commercial loan, you will still most likely have a lender fee. This lender fee can be anywhere from 0.25% to 1% of the loan value. And the last thing that you wanna be aware of is that in most cases, as the borrower, you will be responsible for paying your own legal fees and the legal fees of your lender. This is not the case in the residential financing world. If you have specific questions about financing a multifamily building in Canada, connect with a commercial mortgage broker and they should be able to answer most of those questions for you. If you have comments and questions for me, you can leave those in the comment section below. If you're not already doing so, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram where I post regularly. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on Tuesday.